Good morning. My task is to talk about echocardiography and its appropriateness for evaluation of cardiac structure and function. I'm a president of the American Society of Echocardiography this year. I'm also a professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic and director of the echocardiography laboratory there. But by way of disclosure, I'd like to say that I think echocardiography is just such a fabulous tool and I use it every day in the care of my patients. Our society is dedicated to the excellence in the practice of cardiovascular ultrasound. This is our mission statement. We're a society of 15,000 members that includes physicians and allied health staff. And we're really committed to education, advocacy, research, innovation, and service to our members and to the public. We, we, the ASE, contributed to the writing of this document, the appropriate use criteria for echocardiography. This was a collaborative effort with the American College of Cardiology and various professional societies that worked to develop guidelines for when it is appropriate to use echocardiography and, of course, when it is inappropriate and when the use is uncertain. And similar guidelines are available for other cardiovascular imaging techniques. But it's important to recognize that in this document, there are 97 appropriate uses for echocardiography. And it's certainly beyond the scope of my talk today to discuss all 97, but we've tried to summarize those in the handout that is available in your materials. We'll talk about a few common clinical situations. This is a common situation in cardiovascular medicine practice, the patient who presents with chest pain or shortness of breath. Chest pain can be musculoskeletal, and shortness of breath might be from the lungs, or it might even be from deconditioning. But we're interested in excluding cardiovascular etiologies for these conditions, and these are broad. The differential is broad. It includes coronary artery disease, valvular heart disease, pericarditis, cardiomyopathy, aortic dissection, and pulmonary hypertension. We don't want to fail to recognize these. So which test should we use? Well, this is an example of a patient who presented with chest pain. And his local physician had done a nuclear perfusion study, uh, exercise spec test. And the study was normal, so he was dismissed. Go on your way, you don't have coronary artery disease. But the patient continued to have chest pain. And so he came to our institution with that complaint, and the doctor decided to get an exercise echo. Well, we in the echo lab took one look at his aortic root, noted that it was dilated, and decided not to do a symptom-limited maximal exercise test. Instead, we did this transesophageal echo, and you can see this flap here in his aorta. This patient has an aortic dissection. So that's something that wouldn't be recognized by the nuclear perfusion study, but nicely recognized by the echocardiographer. This shows the receiver operating characteristic curves for exercise echo and exercise spec. And you'll see that the characteristics here, and this is using coronary angiography as the gold standard, the characteristics, the best combination of sensitivity and specificity was with exercise echo, not exercise spec. The investigators here concluded that you could use either, but it certainly raises the question of why exercise echo isn't used more commonly. Both were superior to testing without imaging. If we consider the patient with, where we're trying to rule out ischemic heart disease, the patient who presents with chest pain or dyspnea, and look at the various tests that we can use to try to sort this out, I've approximated their accuracy, cost, and versatility here. The accuracy of coronary angiography, well, that's considered our gold standard. But indeed, sometimes it shows a blockage, and we don't necessarily know about its functional significance. 
and really a stress test is going to better define that for us. CT angiography will show the anatomy also, provided that the anatomy is not obscured by overlying calcium. And the cost for these tests, stress echo, is the least expensive. Coronary angiography, considerably the most expensive. But importantly, the versatility of stress echo, the ability to recognize those other causes of chest pain besides coronary artery disease, is really unparalleled. This shows the comparative radiation doses with these different imaging tests. Now, I think it's appropriate that we discuss this at a forum like this because the people who use ionizing radiation for their imaging are saying it's not so bad, it's okay, it's in the background. You get 3.5 millisieverts per year anyway. So, um, but there are significant amounts of radiation with coronary angiography, coronary CTA, SPET, SPECT and PET, and it's only echo and CMR that have none. In fact, the radiation doses might even be higher than this depending on the imaging protocol that is utilized in the particular test. It's not just the radiation, but there are other risks to some of these tests. The tests that involve contrast uh, can be toxic to the kidneys. And then coronary angiography also has an associated risk of stroke that has been under-recognized. Lots of coronary angiograms are performed in the United States every year, as shown here, over a million of them. And if they've done, when they've done MRIs to look at the head after patients have had a, a coronary angiogram, you can see that the incidence of stroke is not insignificant. Now, some of these are subclinical, but still, if you consider the number of U.S. patients with some new brain lesion after the coronary angiogram, it's quite a lot of patients. Now, the people who criticize echo will say, oh, yeah, but you can't always get it. You can't, you can't always see the heart, but really, with our current state-of-the-art technology and with the appropriate use of our contrast, which is microbubbles, if you can't see the, all the segments of the heart well, the feasibility of echo has become very high. You can see more than 99%. It's really similar to SPECT. And CT angiography, I think we don't really know exactly what the specificity, sensitivity, or feasibility of this are because of the relatively small numbers of patients in the studies and because of exclusions of patients because of age or coronary calcification. What about heart failure? This is another one of those common problems that we see every day in the cardiology area. It affects 5.8 million Americans and accounts for many hospital discharges. It's a very expensive um, uh, diagnosis to have, resulting in high treatment costs, and it's a very common cost of hospital admission and readmission. We know that ejection fraction is an important measure to have when we're dealing with heart failure, and this shows the relationship of mortality with ejection fraction in patients with myocardial infarction treated with thrombolysis. And ejection fraction has been used for determination of prognosis, guidance of pharmacologic therapy, and deciding who should get a cardiac defibrillator. But that's really not all we want to know when we're seeing a patient with heart failure. And when we want to evaluate someone with heart failure, you not only want to know about systolic function, but diastolic function, which is also a common cause of heart failure. We like to know the etiology of the heart failure, whether it's coronary disease, cardiomyopathy, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or valvular disease. We want to know if there's coexistent valvular disease or pericardial constriction. And the only test that is going to give us all of this information is echocardiography. The second best would be CMR, but that 
depends a, a bit on how much, how long you're going to scan the patient and which CMR protocols you're going to use. But these tests convey far more information than CT angiography and way more than SPECT. We've now developed very, very sensitive and specific ways for quantifying serial myocardial function and regional myocardial infu function um, with echocardiography. And this involves strain and strain rate imaging. This shows an example of a display that we get with strain rate imaging. Strain rate imaging involves assessment of myocardial deformation. And this is perfect for quantifying changes in function in a patient receiving chemotherapy. This patient had overall normal contractility of their heart, but we can see that by this sensitive strain imaging, there were abnormalities in this patient with a peak systolic strain of minus 13. So for serial assessment of systolic function, echocardiography is accurate, portable, reproducible, widely available, non-invasive, less expensive, and safe. So if you're going to be using a serial study, repeat studies, this is certainly the test that you'd want to choose. What about valvular function? There are many indications for echocardiography in the appropriate use guidelines. Some of them are detailed here. We use it when we suspect valvular heart disease for an initial assessment, but also in a patient with known valvular disease when there's been a change in symptoms, or if the patient has moderate or severe valvular disease to reevaluate the patient after a year. It's also useful for assessment of prosthetic valves. This is a transthoracic echocardiogram in a patient with rheumatic valvular disease. We can see that there's mitral stenosis, massive left atrial enlargement, and some thickening of the aortic valve as well. And I have the next. And here with color flow imaging, we can see that there is mitral regurgitation and aortic regurgitation. And with Doppler, we are able to measure the gradient across the valves. And in this patient, we're not just looking at this or approximating it. We're actually quantifying how much regurgitation there is in each flow, in each, across each valve, and the gradient across the mitral valve. And we also estimate the right ventricular systolic pressure. So it's a very quantitative assessment. Echocardiography is valuable for guiding interventional procedures. And here we can see that there is periprosthetic mitral regurgitation, this jet right here in this patient who was referred for percutaneous closure of a paravalvular leak. But with three-dimensional echocardiography, we can see that this is not suitable for percutaneous closure with a device because this is a very, very large crescenteric defect here. Finally, what about the costs? This is the global RVUs for Medicare patients for these various cardiovascular imaging tests. And of course, the RVUs would be multiplied by some number uh, depending on your location, and that would determine the price for a Medicare patient for these different tests. And you can see what a bargain echocardiography is. So in summary, what are the advantages of echocardiography? It's more portable and less expensive compared to other imaging modalities. It can be used in patients with pacemakers and defibrillators, other metal in contrast to CMR. It's radiation free. It's perfect for serial assessment of patients. It's non-invasive. We don't even need an IV in most patients. There's no iodinated contrast. You can use it in utero to in the very frail elderly patients all ages. And it has diagnostic, prognostic, and interventional applications. Results are immediately available, and it's highly versatile. Thanks for your attention.